be in accordance with your will. And I ask that you uh, grant these board members wisdom and, and knowledge and understanding and, and all of their actions. And God, we're so grateful for the teachers, the staff, the students, the parents, and the community in which we live that uh, we're so so supportive of, of this, these students and their endeavors. And God, I ask that you uh, bless us with uh, continued success and in, in our efforts. And we're grateful for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. And uh, we're, we're so uh, indebted to you, and we love you so much. And it's Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Frazier. Next, we'll have the pledges, and we have the Godly Middle School Student Council. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now for the, wait, now for the Texas flag. I pledge, I honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. Next, we'll move into recognition, and we have uh, Mr. Flood with the Godly High School volleyball team and Godly High School cross country team. Yeah, so always excited to honor uh, what our kids do. Uh, this fall, we had a successful fall as well. Um, had our entire girls cross country team make it to state. Um, so really proud of them and excited for the work they did. And with all these students, the hard work they put in, there are adults that are spending time with them. Uh, and appreciate the coaches for all the work they do and the time they spend up here as much with these girls and getting them safely to and from. Uh, so without further ado, I will let Coach McFarland come up and talk about the cross-country team. I've never spoken to this little microphone. I usually have one in my hand. I think I will pick it up. <laughs> well, I appreciate the chance to come talk about these girls. Um, if you don't know me, I could do that for a long, long time. It really is a, a pride and joy of mine, and, and finding somebody that uh, is willing to talk about cross country is hard to do. <laughs> Most people don't really want to do that for very long, but uh, I could talk about these girls for a long time, and um, it's, it's a little different because normally – uh, since 2011, we would have already had our athletic banquet, and we've kind of changed how we're doing that. And so I haven't even had a chance to to uh, give out awards or, or talk about these girls individually. And so uh, I'll certainly find a happy medium so I don't <laughs> talk too long um, and try to save the individual stuff for our sports banquet. Um, but just real quick, I do want to thank our parents that were able to be here. Um, it really is the, the reason why these girls are successful. There's no question um, without the parents that you can't do this. Uh, and in fact, if, I, if I'm going to put a young girl on my varsity team, I usually meet with the parents um, to make sure they're going to be willing to do everything that they have to do. Uh, and they, they're the ones that make this happen. They make these girls get up. They drive them back and forth. They make sure they uh, go to bed at a decent hour and uh, – you go down this list of young ladies and every one of them have somebody at home, you know, who's pushing all the buttons making this happen. So I appreciate the parents. Um, Ms. Swam is back here. If you don't know, I work at Lynx. Um, Ms. Swam is our principal. Um, she comes from a completely different background from me, but 
she supports this team in hiding. Nobody probably even knows she's there, but if you ever see her desk, it's stacked with busy work, and there's a track and cross-country schedule right there on the wall. And so she supports us. And then obviously Mr. Flood uh, and the admin. Um, you know, there's not a person in this district that doesn't want these girls to be successful. And so that's, why, that's another reason why we are. Um, just real quick, I'm not going to go real into detail, but just as a team, um, and I want to do this just so you can kind of respect the commitment that these girls put out. They had 29 workouts before the first day of school uh, in the summer, um, and the attendance was excellent. Um, they go 13 weeks starting in August um, at 6 a.m. Uh, they went to two organized timed events, and on a Saturday, they raced in nine official races uh, between August and, and October. Uh, and then they do this while they're uh, committed to other things. We have two full-time volleyball players, um, two full-time band members, uh, full-time soccer girls. And so they do all of this uh, and everything else and so it's really really remarkable what they do so i just want to point out the level of commitment um like mr flood said um they did make it to state but if i could just go back a couple uh they're uh district 10 champions uh for the third time in five years uh for the sixth year in a row uh went to regionals as a team um and we've been so close year after year you have to be in the top four out of 23 teams to make it to state and this year they finally got it done they were fourth at regionals in advance of state that's the first time since 1997 that that's happened here um and so yeah i'll go ahead and introduce these girls and recognize them individually if y'all want to go ahead and come up So the UIL only allows seven girls on a varsity. We have 10 here. Three of them are alternates. Um, that's a big deal. That means they're uh, the top three JV girls. They, they go with us to regionals. And there was a moment, there was a time this year when we were, were potentially going to run, at one point, possibly all three at regionals. We had um, multiple a sickness. We had an injury. Um, and so... It's not easy to get girls to continue to practice for two more weeks for no reason to be an alternate. These girls did that. Um, and so I'll introduce them first. Emma Lindemood is a sophomore. Nola Briscoe and Jalissa Ortiz were our three alternates. <laughs> Nola was the JV district champion. Jalissa finished second at district and Emma finished fourth at district. And then now to our seven varsity runners, freshman Kenzie Riney. She finished 12th at district. Sophomore Sadie Huey. She's a district medalist. She finished 10th at district. Sophomore Jordan Giesman. She's also a district medalist, finishing 8th. Sophomore Sophia Hodges, <laughs> district medalist, she finished seventh. Stephanie Favela, sophomore. <laughs> Stephanie was the district 10 4A champion, and I can't find the last time that a, a girl won the district cross, cross country meet individually. It goes back into some records that weren't kept very well before the internet and things like that, but it's been a long time. Um, and she was also a regional medalist, so she finished in the top ten at regionals, which means if the team had not advanced, she still would have advanced the state as an individual. So that's really hard to do. Um, sophomore Michaela Jaton. She finished third at district. And then I did leave Paola last. <laughs> She's our lone senior. Um, Paola's stuck it out for a long time. That's hard to do in a sport like cross country. Um, to keep going and do it year after year after year is really hard. 
Most girls don't do it for four years and finish it out. Um, she did it all the while while maintaining her grade. She's academic all state. Um, no stats though for Paola. I'm just going to leave it at this with just some a description. She may be possibly the most dependable runner that I've ever had. Um, when she says she's going to be there, that's where she is. And when she's not there, uh, it's there's a legitimate reason. And uh, just the most dependable integrity, all of these things come to mind. Um, and I wish I had more like her. We're super, super excited to watch where she goes as she graduates and what she does in track. But 2023 Lady Cat Cross Country Team. Um, and one more group to recognize, so our district champs in volleyball this year, we're excited to recognize. Uh, Coach Hammett had another function. We appreciate all the time she gives and what she does, uh, but she's also a mom and has other things she needs to do at times. So Coach Schuyler Warwick, one of her assistants, is going to fill in for Coach Hammett tonight. Um, so Coach Hammett had a few words that she would like for me to read to all of you here. Um, she says, first of all, I would like to thank the board members for having us here tonight. We appreciate all that you do, not only for our, for our athletic program, but for our entire school district. Um, our success would not be possible without all of your support. Um, these young women right here next to me uh, accomplished so many things this season, a few of which include a 28-7 and overall uh, winning record this season, 12-0 and in district, back-to-back -back district champions in 2022 and 2023, um, by district champions three years in a row, and then an area runner-up losing in five close sets to Aubrey, who went on to the regional finals. Um, to top it off, this group of Lady Cats also received several district, county, and state awards um, she's so proud of you guys. We all are, um, myself included. Seeing your hard work day in and day out every day is incredible. Your dedication to your sport and your teammates is um, really amazing to see. Um, hopefully many more successful seasons to come um, from the Lady Cat Volleyball team. Um, so congratulations to you ladies for a job well done this season. Um, when I call your name, please step forward to receive your certificate. Sophomore Bella Van Wart. Academic All District, District 10 4A, First Team All District, and All Johnson County Most Improved. Congratulations, Bella. <laughs> Junior Kitsia Cortez, District 10 4A, Honorable Mention, All Johnson County Honorable Mention. <laughs> Junior Kyla Williams, Academic All District, District 10 4A, Honorable Mention, All Johnson County Honorable Mention. Junior Amari Govea, Academic All District, District 10 4A, Co Newcomer of the Year, and All Johnson County Co Newcomer of the Year. Uh, she's not here. Junior Bree Hubbard, Academic All District, District 10 4A, First Team All District, and First Team All Johnson County. Congratulations, Bree. Senior Trinity Roden, Academic All District, District 10 4A, Second Team All District, Second Team All Johnson County. Uh, senior Katrina Leverett, Academic All District, District 10 4A, Second Team All District, Second Team All Johnson County. Senior Ashton Anglin, Academic All District, District 10 4A, First Team All District, First Team All Johnson County. Congratulations, Ashton. Senior Logan Reed, Academic All District, TGCA Academic All State, 
District 10 4A Offensive MVP, first team, all Johnson County. Congratulations, Logan. <laughs> Senior Bryn Staten, Academic All District, TGCA Academic All State, District 10 4A Co Setter of the Year, all Johnson County Co Setter of the Year, holds the season and career school record for assists. Um, and then also, Lila Heiner and Peyton Bauer joined us on our playoff push this season. Um, they stepped up in a big way for us. Thank you, ladies, for all that you did for this team this year. Um, last but not least, Senior Bailey Mobley, Academic All District, District 10 4A MVP, All Johnson County MVP, TGCA All State, holds the season and career school records for kills, digs, and aces. And of course, uh, head coach Courtney Hammett was the District 10 4A Coach of the Year. Congratulations, ladies. All right, next we'll move into the public participation portion of the meeting. At this time, we extend the opportunity for public participation portion of this meeting in compliance with Section 551.007 of the Texas Government Code. We have two people signed up to address the board tonight. Public participation provides the general public the opportunity to address the board regarding topics listed on the agenda. Persons attending the meeting and wishing to participate in a public forum must complete a sign-up form and submit the form to the board secretary or designee 10 minutes prior to the meeting being convened. Each individual addressing the board will have three minutes to make their presentation. Personal attacks on district employees or students will not be allowed. All participants are expected to speak with respect and civility and maintain a calm, professional demeanor. Upon expiration of the three minutes, I will call the next person that signed up to speak. Please note the Open Meetings Act does not require the board to respond to any comments or complaints from a member of the public regarding an agenda item. We will now begin public forum. First, we have Nova Olson. Ms. Goodlow will keep your three minutes, and we will notify when there's one minute left. Your three minutes will begin now. In regards to the long-range uh, facility planning and change in board member elections from cumulative to by position, um, there's been a repetitive and deeply concerning lack of transparency with a punitive response to questions from stakeholders. Harassment and serious threats have been utilized to attempt to silence points of view, which for clarification, Mr. Stevenson, is abridging First Amendment rights. Those points of view not in agreement with the current administration. When I've attempted to observe or educate myself as a stakeholder and voter, I have been shut out and or accused of, and I quote, aggressively questioning. It, makes, it all makes me wonder, what are you afraid of stakeholders learning? I am again asking trustees for you to start providing information to stakeholders, like board book documents, those things that would explain what decisions are being made, what's being discussed by the board, including district bond planning information in its entirety, including how much money is being paid by these entities which stand to gain monetarily from being involved in this process.
Thank you. Next we have Brian Hunt. Your three minutes will begin now. Okay, thank you, Board. I just wanted to speak on item 6B tonight as we recognize one of our new officers. And I want to take, a, take the time and the uh, ability, my rights as a uh, per public participation is to say thank you for creating our Godly ISD Police Department. I had a staff member come up to me today and they have a four-year-old son and their four-year-old son knew Officer Rizzo. How awesome is that? That a four-year-old now has a good relationship with the police officer and that would not have happened if this board and this administration did not have the vision to start our police department. So thank you for that. They have been so helpful in implementing some of our state standards and it's just so great to see them on campuses each and every day doing great things for kids, helping staff members, helping all of us. They have been such a blessing. So thank you for that vision. Thank you for starting that and thank you for supporting it. Uh, and she has been such a blessing to me. I know to Chief Quinteros as well. And we just look forward to her continuing to be here and, and keep doing great things for kids. So thank you. Thank you. So next we'll move into superintendent reports. All right, I think first up we have, uh, we were gonna introduce off. All right, good evening everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, it is uh, my pleasure as Godly ISD's Chief of Police to introduce you to the Police Department's newest member. Please meet Officer Alex Rizzo. A little bit about Alex. She was born and raised in the state of Florida. She attended the University of Central Florida and earned a Bachelor of Science in Health and Public Affairs and Criminal Justice. During her studies, she specialized in forensic science and molecular and microbiology. Alex is certified as a crime scene investigator, as well as, crime, as in crime analysis and data mapping. Alex began her career law enforcement in 2009 when she first interned for the Brevard County Medical Examiner's Office. Alex transferred to the Hillsborough County Medical Examiner's Office where she worked as a forensic technician and medical legal death investigator. Alex then went on to work for the Kissimmee Police Department as a crime scene investigator and certified specialist in firearms, explosives, trajectory analysis, and reconstruction. Alex is IAI, that's International Association for Identification certified, as well as Florida IAI certified in forensics. Alex was trained at the Seminole County Sheriff's Office Academy, where she was one of three females out of a total of 400 applicants to be selected for their very first ever sponsored academy. Officer Rizzo served the community as a deputy sheriff and was following her passion by beginning the process of transferring to the schools as an SRO, school resource officer. Alex moved with her family to the great state of Texas and shortly after arriving, continued her career in law enforcement as an officer serving the communities of North Texas with the Burleson Police Department, University of North Texas Police Department, and Godley Police Department. It was during this time that Alex honed her skills working patrol and conducting investigations as well as engaging in community-oriented policing, all while, con all while continuing her education and training. With her years of experience in law enforcement, coupled with her formal education, Alex earned her Advanced Peace Officer Certificate, and with time, she will very soon be awarded her Master's Peace Officer uh, Certificate here in Texas. Alex joined Godly ISD Police Department in October of 2023, and in that short time, she has already become a favorite of the students and staff members at all of our campuses. Alex is certified in ALERT, that's Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training, or Active Shooter Response Training, and she is slated to attend instructor school and SRO school in early 2004. Alex's training, education, personal and professional experience, and outgoing personality make her a well-rounded and highly valued asset to the district, as well as to the children of this community. Thank you for your service, Officer Rizzo, and welcome to Godly ISD family. I have a few questions. Sure. And uh, maybe uh, for Dr. Deer, but um, 
one of my questions was answered that she was hired October of 2023. I wasn't sure what month she was hired in. Uh, but my question is, are we currently hiring any other SROs or is hiring open or closed? Um, we do not plan on hiring any more this school year. We okay. hope to probably add, hopefully add another one, um, perhaps maybe next school year, depending on budgeting. Okay, and then my next question is, what is the application process for SROs? Are all SROs who uh, go to the interview process, do they receive a polygraph test? So when it pertains to uh, doing a background investigation, if applicants make it to that portion, then yes, a polygraph test is a part of the background process. Okay. And then uh, lastly, according to DC Local, any employee that is non-contractual can uh, be accepted, or excuse me, there's an exception for board approval. Is she contractual or non-contractual? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Construction updates. All right. Good evening. Uh, Jeff Stevens, Reader Construction, here to give you an update on uh, Godly High School Phase 3, the Fine Arts Edition. Um, can't see a whole lot change here. Uh, we've got our cap sheet on the roof on area A and B, which means roof is pretty much done. Um, you can kind of see a little bit at the top of the photo. We started doing some flat work around the exterior of the building, sidewalks. And there right the, on the right side of the photo, you can see we've got the sidewalks going. Uh, almost done with exterior sheathing down C, we've got, uh, which is the, the band hall, the storm shelter addition. Um, we've got, I think, probably 70 or 80% of our windows in. And that brings us to the inside. Uh, this is CL and I. This is at the serving lines looking out. Um, about 60% through with tape, bed, and uh, texture and paint. We've got all of our overheads done, ceiling grids in. Um, we're starting to drop lights and put ceiling gr or, uh, HVAC registers in. Um, that ought to be done this week, and then we'll start putting ceiling tile up. And this is from the temporary wall looking out. Um, and so you've got the serving line kitchen area on the right. No. Sorry, I can't really see that up there. All right, so yeah, here we go. Uh, so you've got the serving lines, kitchen on the left. Um, again, same thing, tape bed texture is almost done. Uh, we're supposed to be polishing floors starting Wednesday after Christmas. That's about a three-day process. Um, here is a picture of the kitchen. Uh, the kitchen's pretty much complete, waiting on kitchen equipment. Kitchen equipment's supposed to start arriving tomorrow. They'll set it in place. We've got a couple days' worth of uh, plumbing and electrical connections that we've got to make, and then they've got to, the kitchen folks will come back and commission all the equipment. And then this is where I had a hard time kind of taking pictures because our mason is really doing a wonderful job. Um, I've shared a photo from this spot, I think the last two months previous, and all you could see is a very large room. Um, our mason's doing a fantastic job with CMU. So he'll probably, and this is in the storm shelter, so we'll probably be done with masonry uh, just right at the very start of the new year. So not next week, but the week after. Um, and then that means we can fin go out, start continuing with wall finishes, MEP overhead. Um, but our mason, uh, I have to speak very highly of them because they've come in and gone much faster than we thought they were going to. And so this is another photo uh, standing in this exact same spot. I've shared two photos uh, the last two months previous, and, and it's completely unrecognizable because uh, they've almost got all the walls up in the storm shelter. And that gets through the update. Any questions? Standard question, substantial completion date. Uh, still January 24th. Okay, I have to tell you uh, thank you for communicating with your team and stressing that with the team. Mm -hmm. um, I happened to be driving by last night 
at about 8 o'clock, mm -hmm. and I noticed things were open that aren't normally open at 8 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. So I stopped and asked whoever it was. Name was Dennis. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yep, we got people working. We're going to meet January the 24th. So you're communicating well with your team, and they are believers in it. Yeah, we've got, okay. a, uh, we've, got, we've got a good internal team, and we've got uh, a great group of subcontractors on this project. So it, uh, it definitely helps. I appreciate that. Good. Anything else? Good. Thank you all. All right, going into the update for phase two. Uh, these photos are about a week and a half old now, but you can see this is the wild uh, looking east. We have the roofing complete, which is great. Uh, you'll actually see some photos a little bit later or more current from the ground looking up. Uh, we have all the openings enclosed, the windows installed, as well as the one portion you see there on the southwest side is enclosed as well. Uh, metal paneling is continuing up the building. Uh, we got the balance of it should be here the rest of the end of this week to keep us going uh, and complete the, the wild and move over to the arena. This, of course, is looking at the wild from the east elevation. You can see all the glass is in on this face along the collaborative areas at the top there. Uh, you'll start seeing railing and ceiling going in on those precast panels up at the top, uh, starting to really close that in. and looking complete. This is down low. This is from just last week. You can see we have all the windows enclosed. On the north elevation there, we have the metal panels, the vertical ones going up. Those are continuing as well as that archway right there going into the uh, seating area is getting bricked up and will be furred out for the panels over the archway. This is going through the wild. This is actually the tech room on the south side. Uh, what I'm showing here is that we have all our grid in. We're setting fixtures. And we're actually starting to close this up, uh, the hard lids now. We started AC units up today, starting today. So we'll start getting conditioned air through that space, which is real good, which will let us start to get some of the flooring in, start putting doors up, really uh, pushing through this area. This is the bathroom. You can see we have finishes, and there's one of the hard lids in the bathroom, uh, taped and floated, getting ready to be sanded and textured. And down the corridor, you can see that's already been painted and ready for the lay-in. Uh, this is the second floor, looking down at the aluminum bleachers. You can see we have the railing going in there, as well as around to the connector area. You can see we have the topping slab poured along that full radius uh, and we'll be starting to install railings uh, by the end of the year through here. This is over at the arena. Uh, we've actually started putting the white cap down over the roof. So this dried in, but on its way to completion, uh, the roofing portion here. You can see we've, we've installed windows and you probably noticed as you came in today, we have a lot of the glass in on the first and second floor on this east north and south side, really starting to make it, uh, make it look different over there. This is inside the arena itself. Uh, you can see we have all the mechanical going in overhead. We're starting to pull out those dance floors. The right picture is actually looking east, and you can see the majority of that dance floor is pulled out. The fur down is, is rocked, and we'll start closing that up, and you'll start seeing the overhead fixtures and speakers going in. Uh, we're running the electrical over to them now. And so you'll start seeing those hung up in there. Of course, you have your scoreboard and your fastball goals already up. This is looking at the visitor side, or uh, building F. You can see we have the main structure poured. We're working on the ramp coming up. All that steel is installed for the second floor there. Uh, we're setting deck now. Uh, gearing up to pour that second floor deck and really continue up uh, with the walls there. Any questions?
Can you give us the completion dates for all of the projects? Absolutely. The WILD is uh, March 5th right now of next year, and the arena is tracking for uh, 513. So those have changed pretty drastically. What, why? Uh, what the were main, the factors? The big issue there, which we finally have resolved, is a permitting issue with uh, Bayou Vista or Bureau of Veritas. And we've gotten that resolved. We got inspections that was holding up some overhead work, which we're now able to complete. So we've actually uh, accelerated and had trades come in over the weekend and really knock out that work that was getting held up to suck that time back in. So you'll start seeing that being impacted as well, coming back the other way. Are you going to be taking any other measures to try to regain some of the time that you've lost? Uh, we're looking at everything, obviously, sequencing. We try to minimize it as much as we can. We're still evaluating everything that impacted because uh, we just had it resolved last week. Um, you may not be able to answer this question. What's the seating capacity in the arena? Ooh. Uh, you're gonna Somebody get else off. might. Yes, I bet Aubrey can answer that question for me. I'm sorry. I would have, I'm going to give him the wrong number. The seating capacity in the arena should be around 1,900. 1,900. Is that uh, with the? That are we calling the that the presentation, presentation room on the end? Okay. That will seat around 300. Okay, so it's 1,600 and 300. Thank you. Yes. Um, what is our current gym capacity? Anyone? That's okay. We can look in. I can get that later. Thank you. Absolutely. Anything else? I don't know if it's that high. I think it's lower than that. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we'll move into the business portion of the meeting, and first we'll consider the consent agenda items, which is minutes of the regular meeting, November 27, 2023. It's the special meeting of December 3rd, 2023, and special meeting of December 11. 2023 district financial report district tax report district monthly and investment district monthly investment and cash report and also considering authorizing an alternate approver to act as the superintendent alternate for approving staff requests through TEA account I have a few questions um, on item 7a1 the meeting minutes for 1127 there's a revision uh, that needs to be made for the item consider approval to the resolution of the official ballot for Johnson County Board of Directors appointment under the second motion um, there should have been one no vote for myself it said past 6-0 it should have been 5-1 and then on item 7a2 I noticed a budget deficit for food service of $222,974 and a budget deficit of $850,631 for the INS debt service. Do we have funds to cover these deficits? Yes, we do. I'll let Ms. De Palma come up here Thank and explain. You. Yes, first, as Dr. Deere explained, we do have funds to cover this. In addition, these are same as the reports from the previous month. There's been no change in that. So this is um, going back to the original budget that was adopted by the board. So these deficits were adopted previously. But yes, there are fund balance um, to cover these. Thank you. You're welcome. And then um, another question on item 7A5. Um, I was just curious what the approver for the TEA teal accounts are. I wasn't familiar with that. I just was curious what that is. I'll let Mr. Carnes answer that one. It's just one of the many things we have to do in our, our right. TEA so, accounting. Uh, TEA, teal is TEA login, and so we have people throughout the district that need access to different accounts when new people come in or uh, when things change. I'm basically the guy that goes in and clicks um, yes, that they're okay, that they're good people, and that they uh, are approved. So 
Um, TEA then sent this to us, I think, last week that basically my subscription is running out and I need to, I need to re-up my subscription to be able to approve that. Just a little thing that just takes something off of Dr. Deere's plate. Okay, thank you. And I think there's, we've several, like Aramie, she's an approver. I think Dr. Nix is an approver for certain things. I, there's a lot of different people are approved different, different items for TEA. Any other questions? I'll entertain a motion now. Can we remove the minutes from the motion so that we can get those corrections made before we vote on it? The minutes for November 27, 2023? Yes, sir. Yes. So this will be for the special meeting of December 3rd, 2023 and the special meeting of December 11, 2023. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. A motion by Terry, a second by Krista. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, number 7B will consider recommendation from the 2023 Long Range Facility Planning Committee. All right, you guys come on up to the podium here. We've got a few members of the Long Range Facilities Planning Committee that have been gracious enough to come up and, uh, and talk us through the recommendation. We really appreciate you guys coming up. Phyllis, do you need to queue anything up or are they just going to take it away? Okay. Good evening, President McKittrick and trustees. We are the representatives of the Long Range uh, Facilities Planning Committee. Our charge was to recommend projects to be included in a potential bond election. I'm Jamie Roy, most of you know me. I have three children in the district now. Uh, one's already graduated. And um, we, I've been in the district for uh, 14 years. I had kids in the district for 14 years. And I've seen a lot of changes, a lot of growth, um, all primarily to the positive. Um, and what we're seeing now, and the reason that I wanted to be on this, this uh, board was to promote the, um, the growth of the district in a way that would um, lead to a continuum of the education that my children are already receiving and have received. And that is primarily the smaller classrooms, um, the facilities that are going to uh, promote their growth and other children's growth. So um, we'll introduce the rest of them here. Good evening. <clears throat> Name's Cody Hudson. I have uh, three kids in the district. They're all at Legacy. I have a fifth, a third, and a kindergartner at this time. Um, we've been in this district for about four years now. Um, and one of the main reasons we wanted to be a part of this was uh, knowing that, you know, we made the choice to have children, so we got to do the right thing by them. Um, and making sure that this district's taken care of is, is vital to our children's success at the end of the day. So thank you. Hello, uh, Travis Spears. I've been in the district for, uh, we moved in October of 22. I have one uh, eight-year-old about to be nine at Legacy, and then we have a four-year-old who is at a preschool here in town at a local church and then going to be attending that same elementary school uh, next, next school year. So, and I think um, my colleagues here have already kind of spoke to it a little bit, but, you know, not wanting to have the growth really control uh, us, but having some intention behind it. And we want our kids to have a successful career here in Godly ISD and just making sure that we are extremely intentional about everything that we're putting forth to the board. Um, and then also, you know, trying to make it as transparent as possible. Um, just from my own perspective last year, it was, it was tough to support some of the things that were on the vote last year, but being a part of it last year and seeing the difference of it this year and just I think there was more of an intentional focus and I think we were able to address a lot of what uh, we got back feedback from the community so yeah my name is uh, Greg Fancher uh, I've been in the district I guess about 11 12 years now uh, I've got a seventh grader a ninth grader and then my daughter was in the district for uh, 10 years uh, and so I've been on a few
few of these committees uh, in the past, uh, I will say that I thought this was a really well-run, uh, committed committee, if that makes sense. Uh, um, and I think that they, they truly were trying to focus on uh, needs that we have now, uh, as opposed to aspirational things, as opposed to, well, it'd be really neat if we had this. Uh, we really focused on what was needed uh, in the next few years. And so I think that's where we, we ended up with this. And I'll turn it back over. And we'd like to give a special thanks to everybody who turned up for the many meetings. We did have five meetings in October, November, and December. More than 100 individuals were invited to attend. Average attendance was between 40 and 50 people. Community members, business owners, and parents and staff all were there. Two board members were on the committee, Ms. Lane and Mrs. Goodlow. Uh, we met at locations throughout the district. We actually met at each school, which was uh, a benefit to those who don't have children in, in some of the schools. Uh, they could see the facilities there. Uh, several of the committee members are here tonight. And so if you've served on the committee, please stand and be recognized. So we studied demographic projections, construction costs, financial capacity, opportunities for students, findings from previous uh, committees, and more. Uh, we encourage anyone who wants to know more of what we study to ask any committee member or visit the Godly ISD website. The presentations we saw and the materials we studied are posted for the public to review. So. Uh, what stood out to me in the process personally was just the, um, the clarity with which uh, the members of the Huckabee team and uh, Ms. Phyllis and Ms. Aubrey uh, presented their information. That was very helpful. Some things that I had never learned because I was not on this committee for the prior bond um, and of course the, the bond prior to that several years ago. Um, I. I really would encourage anybody who was not on one of these committees in the future to uh, participate because it is very enlightening to understand what all goes into planning uh, new facilities and, and planning for growth. Um, so I enjoy serving on the committees. I, I enjoy getting to know all the, the members of the committees, the members of the communities, um, teachers. Um, just fellow parents, it's good to know what everybody's goals are. Um, our committee was focused on several categories of projects, projects that addressed enrollment growth, maintenance and renovation projects, projects at the high school and district-wide projects. I'll turn it over to Mr. Hudson. On this slide, you'll see our recommendations. Uh, we agreed that if 70% voted in favor of a project, then we would be, it would be included. Our goal was that 100% of the committee would support the final recommendation. We achieved both of these tasks. The committee was focused on several categories of projects. Projects that address enrollment growth, such as a new, a new school, additions to existing campuses, and transportation, maintenance and renovation projects that extend the life of assets we already own, and provide equity between campuses across the district. Projects at the high school that all district students in the community can take advantage of, and district-wide projects to improve safety and technology. <clears throat> Our recommendation is rooted in the growth uh, God is experiencing. Um, we looked at both the moderate growth and also, um, sorry, lost my spot. Uh, growth comes quickly or moderately, this recommendation will allow us to be ready. Financial outlook is improving. Recent announcements by the Federal Reserve indicate that they will cut interest rates three times in 2024. Uh, experts indicate that the housing market will respond favorably. Every single project in the recommendation will address the challenges that come with being a fast growth school district. This next slide is recognizing the growth of, in our area. We spent a lot of time reviewing the demographic report. We studied the high and moderate growth potential of Godly. 
Under the moderate growth scenario, some campuses could begin to experience crowding in the 26-27 school year. Godley Middle School is projected to be over capacity in the 27-28 school year. The committee is recommending a plan that is focused more on the moderate growth scenario. If the high growth scenario occurs, another bond election could be needed in the next two to three years. High growth scenarios could result in 5,138 students by the 28-29 school year. <clears throat> On the last slide that I'm presenting, two projects that stand out we think about um, would be a new elementary school and renovation in addition to the Godley Middle School. Elementary school number four will accommodate 740 students. The middle school renovation in addition will accommodate an additional 650 students, bringing the total capacity of the middle school to 1,200 students and will serve grades six through eight uh, because the sixth grade campus will soon outgrow being able to hold a full grade level. One call out from this addition and renovation, it would be that the uh, sixth grade would actually have its own wing within the building. Um, so while they would all be able to be together as a middle school, the sixth graders would still be separate from seventh grade. Thank you. Hello again. Uh, as you can see from those last couple slides, uh, growth is happening, you know, regardless of want or uh, any outside market forces. So having that realization, we had to respond, or we felt that we had to respond with intentional action planning. And a critical component of that is hearing our community and our neighbors and understanding what happened with the last bond. And I think one of the, the the main focuses that we received feedback from from the community is they wanted more of the proposed package to be included for maintenance and renovation projects. So in response to that, one of the things that we were able to obtain is an almost 50% of the projected uh, projects are all focused for maintenance and uh, renovation projects. Those projects uh, are not listed on the slide. Oh, sorry about that. So those would include renovations and projects for Legacy Elementary, RB Godley, Godley Middle School, and with a focus for life cycle replacements at the sixth grade campus. The maintenance items include replacements uh, of some roofs, HVAC systems, fire alarm systems, uh, etc. Some campuses will also receive finish updates and other aesthetic improvements. One big call out would be for RB Godley and Legacy Godley. Um, again, I have my eight year old goes to Legacy and one of the focus points again was going to be more of an equity change for kids who are at Legacy or RB Godley versus any of the new schools built up. So I think it does address that uh, concern and feedback one personally as a parent, but then also I know is a bigger concern for a lot of our neighbors and community members as well. All right, the next one. Um, it is not the focus of the bond, um, but there are several high school projects included in our recommendation. Uh, all students in Godly ISD will one day attend the high school. So when completing projects at the high school, it is important to note that these projects have the potential to impact all students. Go to the next slide, please. Oh, sorry, that's, that's it. The, uh, for, for the proposed projects at the high school, the auditorium that seats 1,200 and will operate as a theater classroom, special education addition, ag project center addition, locker rooms for tennis and ag, and paving the home stadium parking lot. Thank you. All right, I guess I get to bring it on home. All right, uh, when we're talking about uh, two specific items that, that I wanted to address, one, um, I don't know what that slide's supposed to look like, but uh, it includes district-wide projects um, such as technology upgrades. 
That doesn't talk about like iPads or, or laptops or anything like that. That's talking about, you know, hardwiring electronics, okay? You gotta run cables. There's, there's, there's new technology every single day. Uh, we need new monitors, we need new uh, projections, boards, things like that. That's the type of technology upgrades that we're talking about, um, not the, the laptops or iPads or anything like that. Uh, we also uh, included some safety and security projects, uh, such as uh, fencing, security film, cameras, um, I think all of those in this day and age, just what you got to do. Uh, and so that's something the board took into consideration, or the committee, I'm sorry. Uh, and then uh, a new transportation center in the purchase of additional buses. Fact is, we're growing, uh, and so we, need, we just need more buses. Uh, and it's, it's really that simple. One of the things that I thought was really good about the committee was we were given two options uh, on the bus allotment. Uh, one, uh, I don't recall the numbers specifically, I'm sure Dr. Deere has those numbers, uh, but one called for a certain number of buses over I think a six to eight year period, one called for a certain number of buses over a three to five year period. The committee went with the three to five year period for this bond because we wanted to really focus on what is absolutely needed right now. Uh, and so yes, there's gonna be a, a need for additional buses in the future, uh, but again, this bond, what do we need right now? No fluff, no stuff, what do we need? Uh, and that's, that's what we ended up with. The next slide, uh, this is kind of my uh, passion speech right here, okay? Uh, and so bear with me for a second. Um, this auditor the, the auditorium that has been proposed uh, has been something that's been discussed in previous bonds. Uh, it's been something that's kind of been pushed to the side. Uh, and I just want to say in the most emphatic way possible, we need this auditorium. This is not uh, something that, that would be great to have. This is not something that, boy gee, that, that sure would be nice. This is something that we have got to have. Uh, Mr. Walker does a fantastic job holding band concerts in the middle school gym. Our kids deserve better. Uh, every other school in the district, uh, every other school that I've been to, frankly, in this area has an auditorium. It's really, frankly, embarrassing that we don't. Uh, there are multiple needs for this auditorium. One, it's a classroom. Uh, every day this auditorium is going to get used. Every day the band kids, the choir kids, the theater kids. Uh, I go to church with the theater teacher, and, and she has put it in my ear to, to mention the, the theater program that is, that is going on uh, now. It's doing a fantastic job. There are businesses now in the city of Godly that are dedicated to theater and choir. Uh, its, its involvement in this community is, is strong. Those businesses are going to be able to have a space in Godly to have those performances, as opposed to, I, I think they're renting out churches in other cities uh, right now for their performances. We can do better. Uh, we should do better for these kids. There's not a single item on this bond that is going to impact more kids than that auditorium. Every single kid in this district is going to, to sit in that auditorium at some point. Uh, and it also uh, has the opportunity for community involvement, has the opportunity for lots of different things. And so, um, unfortunately, when we look at the, the bond proposals and we budget things out, there is the chance that we may not be able to build the auditorium immediately. Um, I, I defer to, to this board and, and to what they wanna do uh, in terms of priorities, uh, but I will jump up and down and, and beg and plead as quickly as you can, please build this auditorium. Uh, okay, that's my high horse. All right. <laughs> All right, uh, getting into the just generalities, okay? These are the recommended projects. Uh, we've got the RB Godley uh, uh, renovation. We've got the different uh, renovations to the other schools, the sixth grade campus life cycle replacements. We've got a new elementary. Uh, we've only got one of those uh, on this cycle. Transportation facility, the buses, the security improvements, the technology upgrades, 
There is uh, a special education addition in here. Um, because we're a growing district, there are needs in that area that we just don't have the classroom space for uh, at the current uh, time. Uh, the Ag Project Center addition, okay, this kind of goes to something personal. My daughter, uh, we, we bought our lamb in June last year, uh, and the Ag building was already full, okay? So I had to keep that thing at my house, uh, and it was a miserable experience. Um, and so I would, I would love to see the addition there so that people like me don't have to have that same experience. Um, locker rooms for the tennis uh, and, the, and the ag facility. Um, and then I guess if you want to say one thing that could be considered a little bit of fluff is, is to pave the home stadium parking lot. But the reason it's included in this project is because the cost savings were so astronomical if we do it now as opposed to, to 10 years from now. I mean, it was almost triple the price if we wait 10 years to, to pave that parking lot. It just made sense to include it uh, into this bond package. Uh, where are we at? Um, the growth, talking about the community on the bonding uh, capacity, uh, it will maintain the current tax rate. We are capped out on the tax rate. Uh, there can be no tax rate increase. I know that, that this board and, and everyone in the community keeps jumping up and down saying that these bonds don't increase our tax rates. Some people are going to believe you, some people aren't. Uh, but we understand that there is no tax rate increase uh, through this bond. Um, and it just kind of is what it is. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, one thing I wanted to say just from, well, let's go to the next slide. Uh, these are, these are some of the projects that we are going to need in the future. We are going to need a couple of more elementary schools. We're going to need a new middle school, as amazing as that sounds. Um, my youngest is in seventh grade, and I was talking to Mr. Flood probably a couple months ago, and he said that that seventh grade class could be the first 6A class in Godly which is ridiculous uh, if you think about it. I mean, when I moved here, this was a 2A. Uh, and my son in the seventh grade could be the first 6A class to graduate from Godly ISD. Uh, so it's coming. Just is what it is. It's, it's, it's here, and it's, and it's going to keep coming. So there's a lot of things that we're going to need in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, and that's, that's some of the things that, that we're going to need. But, but we, again, focused... What do we absolutely need right now? This is what we absolutely need right now. I will gladly go on any Facebook podcast. I will gladly go uh, to any community event that, that wants to have the discussion. I will gladly shout it to the rooftops that these are the projects that we absolutely have to have right now. Uh, and, and I'm willing to fight for it. Uh, and so we understand that you can modify these things. We understand that there may be some additions or subtractions that you make. I would ask, I would beg uh, that you keep some of these, if not all of these, on, on the list, especially the auditorium. And uh, I did want to thank uh, Ms. Goodlow and Ms. Lane uh, for being a part of the, the, the committee. I, I personally sat with Ms. Lane uh, when we were going through these, these different projects, and I appreciated her uh, insight and her leadership uh, in that situation. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, we all raised our hands and said we agree with this proposal. So I, I appreciate uh, the board members that were able to contribute uh, to that. And with that, I think I'm done. I know I talk too much. So that's the litigator in me. I apologize. Are there any questions? I'll answer any questions, too. Let's do this. I'm ready. All right. All right. So I want to preface my questions, and I have a couple. Sorry. Um, I sat on this same committee as a member of the community and as a parent, and I have sat on a previous committee as a board member, and I was not a member of this committee. But I want to thank you because I personally know how much work and how much effort and how much passion each com committee member has put into the work that you are bringing to us tonight. So I just want to say thank you. And any questions I'm asking are not meant to be 
um, anything other than questions. So don't read anything into them. Um, I noticed that several of you are from Legacy. Um, I wanted to see and make sure that all um, campuses were represented on the committee. Um, so we had parents from every campus that was, were, was in attendance at these meetings and had, have, has given their input because I think the parents' input is uh, probably one of the most important pieces. Yeah, I, I personally sat uh, at a table in one of the meetings uh, with parents from each of the elementary schools that we have. Um, my kids have been through every single campus in the district except for the newest elementary school. Uh, so I've, I've, I've been through all of them uh, and, and we've had, uh, I know I personally sat with, with parents that were at each of the other uh, elementary schools. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm glad you have the mic because you passionately spoke about the auditorium. Yep. So is the auditorium equal to a pack that we have discussed before? If not, how are they different? Yeah, so I can talk generally. Okay. Why, why, don't, why don't Mr. Walker answer yeah, that one? Okay. He yeah. does a pretty good job of that. Come to, come to the mic. And while you're going to the, to the mic, specifically speak to seating capacities for me. Um, I kind of showed a little bit of my hand when I asked about the seating capacity of the arena and also of the um, current place that we hold our band concerts, et cetera. Yes, uh, so if you can speak a little bit I to I hope that you things. didn't write down the number that I gave. I've been trying to it's research okay. it more and it's more okay. um, for the number of the arena. Um, uh, so to be honest, the, the seating capacity of a performing arts center and an auditorium, um, it doesn't really have anything to do with a seating capacity. Um, a performing arts center is an item it, that is a standalone from a school um, or, for, or from a venue. It's its own facility that is meant to be a center for the performing arts. Um, different, um, different schools can use it. Um, I, one to easily think about is Mansfield ISD or Arlington ISD that has a standalone performing arts center in the middle of their city or their district. Um, that item must be listed on its own uh, it must be its own proposition, um, just like an athletic facility, like a football stadium or a gym, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, an auditorium is traditionally attached to a school and it can be used day to day as a classroom space. Um, like our theater arts program will use the auditorium every day for seven to eight periods a day. Um, so the, the auditorium is attached to this, it would be attached to this school and used um, as as an auditorium. Um, Performing Arts Center is, uh, I, I told the, the committee that I think that word, was, that, that, um, that word was coming around because that's just what I traditionally call it, the PAC. Um, but what we are asked, what the committee, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not a part of the committee. Uh, what the committee is asking to bring forward is an auditorium. Okay, um, so we have a, a new fine arts wing is what we've been referring to it that um, we're going to be opening in January, right? Yes, okay. Um, so I know that there's space there for a theater arts program. So I'm gonna just kind of be the devil's advocate. Why do we need, we haven't even gotten into our new space that we're gonna accommodate a theater arts program with. Why do they need an auditorium as well? Again, just being devil's advocate because the voters are gonna ask these questions. I'm totally supportive. I don't know who you okay. want to answer questions right now. Okay, whoever wants to take it. Just, okay. uh, just because I'm, I'm helping oversee this, um, there is no theater art space going in to this fine arts expansion. Not. No, ma'am. There are not any classrooms that are... No, ma'am. They're going to stay, where are they right now? In the um, middle school Currently, still? they are in the um, middle school facility across the hallway from the band hall. Um, okay. What was formerly the, the original band hall over mm -hmm. there that we have um, worked hard to... Uh, transform into a, a black box theater. Mm -hmm. um, the theater arts program right now is planning on moving over into the space right behind you. Okay. Um, right now, um, this is not a stage though. Uh, um, they will they will continue using the black like what we what we call the black box the, the black box theater. It's the theater arts classroom over in the middle school space. Um, they will be using that for their production classes and. Um, their performance classes uh, that like, includes one act play um, this past weekend like the witches Pr princess all their performance classes will continue to use um, the middle school facility um, 
Um, did that answer your question? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, you guys want me to keep going, or does somebody else want to ask one? Yeah. I want to follow up with uh, another question. So just to make sure I heard you correctly, what facilities, what capabilities, what uh, space would have been available as a part of a pack? All of those, not just the auditorium itself, but the capabilities will still be incorporated into what we will now call the auditorium? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next question I had was you spoke to the 70% guy, you know, if there was 70%, then it would be put on the list, and your goal was to have 100% support from the committee, and that you, mo multiple people stated that you had 100% of all committee members supporting what you brought to us tonight. That's correct. The, w the way it worked out was uh, we divided up into small groups. I think there was no more than four at a table. Uh, and that table voted on which of the, I think there were something like 30 items or, or something to that effect. It was a lot uh, uh, as to, to what we wanted to recommend. Um, and if it reached 70% of those small groups, uh, then it got put up on the board as something that, that we were willing to at least consider supporting. Uh, and then at the end, uh, we had, uh, well, once we got that 70%, then uh, we had individual votes on each section. And so you could voice whether you, you know, as a, a you know, how high of a percentage, above 70%, we got individually as opposed to the group setting uh, for each individual item. And then at the end, we did one big vote. And we said, you know, does everybody here support this bond package? And everybody voted yes. Uh, we gave everybody the opportunity to voice any disagreements. We gave everybody the opportunity to say, I can do everything but this. And at the end of the day, I mean, there were quite a few people there. Uh, and and uh, everybody in that, that room voted yes that they would support this bond package. I do want to make one caveat to that, and I forgot to mention it in my little spiel. Uh, originally, the bond package was 322 million, that or 325 million, something to that effect, uh, that the group considered. Uh, we had a meeting last week uh, where it was determined that just because of bonding capacity, some of these items may not be able to be built right away, uh, and because of that, there's the potential that these items would cost as much as 355. What what we're asking for. Uh, and so the, the group approved all of these items. At the time, it was estimated it was going to be 325, but that's when we thought, hey, we can build it all right now or, you know, relatively quickly. Uh, but because of the bonding capacity, there's, there's a chance some of this may not be able to be built for four years uh, plus. And, and so that could cost more. Hopefully it doesn't, uh, but we, we built in that contingency up to 355. Thank you. Um, my next question is for Ms. Goodlow and Ms. Lane. Were you in attendance when that vote, that 100% vote was taken? Yes, I was in attendance at that meeting. Okay. Uh, I do have a question though regarding, I wasn't able to go to the meeting last Wednesday because my students had a Christmas performance. Um, but I was wondering how supportive the committee members that were in attendance at last Wednesday's meeting were with the increased cost going from 324 million to 355 million and if there was any concerns voiced um, about that increased cost and also pushing those projects out. Not on the increased cost. Uh, there was no concern on that just because it, it just kind of is what it is on the cost. Unfortunately, we don't get to we don't get to determine that. Uh, at the end of the day, we still felt like it was signif it, it's significantly less than half of what the last bond was. And it, it accounts for needs that are necessary right now in the next three to, I think, three to four years. Uh, and, and so with the bonding capacity, there was some concern uh, that one or more of these items may not be able to be built within that three to four range. But we looked at it as 
but these are necessary in the next three to four years. So what we have brought to the board is what is necessary in the next three to four years, even if it may not be possible in the next three to four years. And, and so it, it's the board's responsibility to determine what gets built when, we understand that, but what we're bringing to the board is what is necessary in the next three to four years, and we're hoping that either through, uh, you know, student move-ins or just a tax base that, that, that rises through commercial activity, whatever we can do uh, to, to help, we're hopeful that with a higher growth rate, um, we, can, we can build these projects in that three to four year window, but that's, that's not up to us. I have a question maybe for Aubrey. Do we know what our current bond capacity is today? I don't have that number offhand, but uh, we did get some scenarios from Jeff Roberts uh, where he shows what it will look like for a moderate growth and an aggressive growth rate that can be shared with you. It was shared with the committee last week. Okay. And, and the committee liked the idea of going with the more conservative growth rate just to make sure. Um, so that's why the, the escalation did drive the price up a little bit. And like, uh, like Greg said, there's, um, like we, we told the committee that, you know, land was going to have to be in this. I said, I know that's one thing that the board will most likely um, choose to add is, is uh, money for land. So they didn't even include that in their recommendation. So, we just talk, anyway. Yeah. Um, one more question, sorry, Absolutely. that's my last one, I promise. Nope. Um, community support, we obviously did not pass our last bond. So my major concern is, do we have the support in our community to pass this bond? And so um, I think we're really lucky to have Mrs. Lane on our, on our board now because she was a proponent, of, or excuse me, you were very much so outspoken about not supporting the last bond. So since you've sat on this committee now, they've obviously had 100% support. How do you think we're gonna be able to get the support from the community that did not support the last bond? My one complaint with the process, which I've been very vocal about, was that the public was not allowed access to these long range meetings to be able to observe. Um, they also were not Facebook lived or streamed by the board to the public. Um, I do see that as being a stumbling block in passing this next bond because the community was very um, outspoken in the last bond that a lack of transparency and a, a lack of including the public in the process from start to finish was a major reason why they did not vote for the last bond. Um, I don't know what the answer is to solve that. I certainly tried to audio record those meetings and share them to the public for transparency. Uh, but I do think that that will be a roadblock we'll have to overcome because the community did make it very clear that they wished they could have sat and observed those meetings. Does this bond have your support? Like I said, that is um, one of the issues I had with this process was the fact that the community was not allowed to observe those meetings. But that that aside, when it comes to voting to put this on the May ballot, will you support it or not? <clears throat> well, that is a part of the process for me. Okay. Um, so that is something I'm still weighing in my okay. head. Uh, I just see that being an issue with voters. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I wanna say one thing on that. Um, and, and, and like I said, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm bogarting this whole thing. I, I apologize, but I do want to say one thing on that is um, you can't have the entire community at these committees. I mean, you can't have 10,000 people show up at the committees. You got you to lessen it somewhat. But I'm a little surprised at that answer, to be quite honest. Um, I sat at Miss Lane's table. Uh, we were, we had a great dialogue, great dialogue. I really appreciated what she was saying. She supported those items. Um, 
I don't know what else to say about that other than, than we were all in support of these items. Uh, and, and so if I need to help in that transparency, transparency in any way, I will gladly, you guys want me to show up at, at meetings in the community, you guys want me to go on podcasts, I will, I will do the song and dance all you want me to do. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you everything I know. Uh, but at the end of the day, everybody in that room said yes to what we've put forward. Yep. I think the gentleman behind had another comment. Just, just wanted to make sure it was kind of known. Like there, there was no barring of anyone from participating or anything like that. I mean, I, I was asked to volunteer, or not asked to volunteer. The volunteer ask was out there, and I, I did it last year. And just to be honest with everyone here in the room, um, I voted. I participated in the committee last year, and I voted against it. I felt it was too broad, it wasn't focused, it wasn't intentional, intentional enough. I plan to support and vote yes on this bond if, it, if we get to that point in May. So I just wanted to add to that and I appreciate the, um, the candor and the focus on transparency because again, I think that that's paramount to have a success uh, out in May. So, appreciate it. So I have a question, but I'm not sure who to direct it to, and it may be too much in the weeds. Um, one of our um, uh, challenges with our current bonds have been contingency, and obviously uh, cost of things have been hard to predict. So what percentages have we included in this bond package or reword in the proposed amount? Yeah, in the current amount we have uh gone a conservative route um, it varies based on how far as projects are, are out you know it's a higher amount about 12 percent a year for the first for the next year or so and then it goes down to I think 11 percent 10 percent 8 percent years moving out um, in addition to that we've also included 10 million dollars in bond contingency in the overall 355 million dollar request um, again just to give those cushions for those unknowns that that might come Thank you. Any further questions? I just want to say thank you to, um, to, to the, especially to the four of y'all and everyone that served on the committee. I know it's um, time away from your families. It's um, not so away from your family and that kind of thing. So um, I appreciate y'all coming out and supporting your community, trying to have a positive impact on your community. And uh, it, it means a lot. And I just want to recognize um, the four of y'all and then everyone else that served on the committee one more time. Yes, thank you guys very much. Okay. And I will entertain a motion now. I oh, know that's just a recommendation. Oh, we, recommendation. We've got a, sorry. We'll, we'll, information we'll chew on, on that for a little over a month and we will come back later with that. All right, next we'll move on to 7C, which is discussion and consideration to approve change order six for Godly High School Phase 2. Yep. All right, uh, last month we shared with you um, the need for some additional contingency funds for High School Phase 2. Um, we talked about the different uh, RFPs that that would allow um, that we could incorporate into the project by doing so. And um, we also discussed um, allocating uh, some money towards some material escalation costs. Um, and those allowances are already in the project. It's just more expanding those to be beyond the change order number one scope of the visitor side, but rather apply it to the entire project. Uh, and then uh, S&P using some of their contingencies as well towards material escalation. Uh, and so uh, you have the formal change order document in your packet. There are no numbers that have changed since it was presented to you last month. If approval of these changes, how will this affect substantial completion dates? 
SMP can probably speak to this more. There are probably some items. I know, for one, the food service equipment in culinary uh, that will extend the substantial completion date of that space. But that doesn't mean that we can't still complete the rest of the building on time and operate it. There might just be a couple of spaces or a couple of pieces that are running a little long. So with the ones that we have proposed on here now, I know the longest lead item one is the kitchen equipment one. Uh, this is something that right now is, as soon as it's released, we're looking at at least four months as far as equipment delivery. Uh, hookup's gonna take a little bit after that. This is not something that would affect your use of the facilities while we're waiting on it. This is something that could come in and install once we receive it. Uh, the bigger question on that one is just going to be with the city. I know they're having um, some restructuring right now on it and getting their buy-in on it. But as far as your use of the facility while these materials are coming in, it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, the fencing, just looking at it here again, what do we have all on here? Yeah, none of these, again, other than just the kitchen equipment, because that's the one that's going to actually have a lead time associated with it, especially with it being in the wild, which is the earlier substantial completion. That one is obviously just going to push out that substantial completion. Y'all, we should be able to receive a uh, TCO for that building while we wait for this equipment to come in, which would let you use the facilities. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Aubrey. I'll make a motion to approve the change order number six for phase two construction as presented and recommended. I'll second. A motion by Craig, a second by Terry. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, opposed? Motion passes 4-1. Um, 7D is discussion and consideration on adopting Godly ISD District Policy BBB Local Board Member Election. So this is uh, the third showing or the third reading of this. Uh, we've talked about this at length. Um, the only requirement is that we, the board, make the, the resolution and assign the places 60 days before the election date. I have a couple of uh, comments. Uh, per policy BBB le legal, and also confirmed by our attorney Rhonda Crass, I just wanna make sure that the board is aware that once we go to places, we can never go back or rescind the action, not even with a new board in the future. Uh, the decision would be absolutely final. And so I would like to see before we do something so permanent for the public to have an opportunity to attend a public hearing, to voice their opinions of the proposed election method so that we can make sure that this is something that the public really wants. One of my main concerns is voter confusion, that the city does their elections with the old plurality method, and if the school district chooses a different method, I could see voter confusion in the future, and I feel as if there is enough voter confusion already. And also, um, I'm not sure why the need for a place system other than if we were to go to a member district because it makes it more difficult for the most popular candidates to get elected at large if we're in a place system without specific member districts. Those are just my concerns. I make a motion to approve the changes to the Godly ISD district policy BBB local as presented and recommended. I'll second. I have a motion by Terry, a second by Craig. Is there any further discussion? Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, Miss Lane, I hear the concern over going to places, but I recall just this very year there was uh, a number of podcasts, broadcast, whatever, um, 
to where I think you participated in speaking of the backwardness of our district for having at large and why we didn't have places. This was back in the, the April-ish, May time frame prior to the election. So I'm a little bit surprised and I'm not trying to attack at all. I'm, I'm seeing an inconsistency that I'm, I'm raising a concern about. Just for clarification, there was no concern on my part that we were at large. I was explaining to people in other towns that weren't familiar with this process that that was the process that Godly used. Um, and so that's why I was addressing that because a lot of people like in Fort Worth were not familiar with the at-large election method. Yeah, fair enough. And obviously Fort Worth is, what, 100 times larger than Godly? So right. uh, total different environment, things that have to be addressed in that kind of environment that would never have to be addressed in a, uh, a godly culture. Again, smaller environment. Um, okay, thank you for the yes. explanation. Um, I guess the um, folks that have been moving in uh, from larger areas are very familiar with the place uh, arrangement. Um, it's generally the smaller communities like Godly or some of the others around the area that um, have the at-large system. So I guess it doesn't really bother me that we would go to uh, a place, uh, if nothing else, to reduce confusion for folks that are moving in. Well, those larger districts, they have single member districts where those board members represent a certain geographical location. And so um, I guess that's the confusion I have with going to places without geographical locations is because like in, uh, in Fort Worth, they represent certain areas. Yeah, but even our, our neighbors to the east of us, Joshua, again, they're not uh, specific to a, a, a region or section of their district. It is just a place um, uh, within their, their district. My, my, I got a question for, uh, I'll direct to Dr. Deer. Um, as a district grows, um, takes on new students, is this, would this be considered like a natural progression of how a, a district would, would move going forward, would be at large and then to places and then to geographical places once that extreme growth is experienced like a Fort Worth or a, obviously a Dallas, somewhere like that? Yes, sir. Only only districts smaller than us are still doing um, just general plurality like we are currently, and all of our neighbors around us um, have places. Only the very largest districts are single member districts like a, a Dallas, a Fort Worth, a Houston. You know, the, the much bigger, larger ones. So, the the vast majority of school districts in Texas use places. So this would be in line. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right, I have a motion by Terry, a second by Craig. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion passes four to one. Uh, next, we'll go to 7E, which is discussed pro proclamation 2024 science textbook selection process. Dr. Caudill? Yep, yep. Hello. Um, and really, this is just informational. It's been quite some time since we've had a proclamation issued, and as we enter, as we enter into this uh, round of instructional material selection, I just wanted to bring you an update on how the process is going to go. Um, the last time a proclamation was issued was in 2020, and so it's been quite some time, probably for most of you all as well. Um, so, under Proclamation 2024, we will be considering instructional materials for science in grades K through high school, as well as technology applications and several CTE courses. We may not select materials for every course. Um, the money won't be there for every course. We may not need materials in every course, um, but definitely science will be our big push because that's all the way from kindergarten through high school. So we will spend a lot of our energy on that. Um, since the last time a proclamation was issued, the State Board of Education has um, changed the way that material adoption works. So now they technically adopt the materials at the state level. They take them through um, TEKS verification, through checking for errors. Um, they go through a process where they open it up to the community across the state. They gather feedback from stakeholders. 
um, and then they issue a state adopted list of materials that are approved by the state and that came out December 1st and um, so we now have a list of materials that we can choose from to um, purchase using our instructional materials allotment funds um, so our process here what we'll do we have an advisory committee that is um, we opened it up to the teachers in the district predominantly science as I said um, we have uh, I want to say 12 people right now that are science teachers across grade bands across campuses it's a good mix we'll meet in January and they'll start looking through all the materials I had 18 boxes show up today of just sample materials um, a good portion of them are going to be online but of course we're going to have some um, textbook workbook things that we'll need to look through so they'll start reviewing the list of materials from the state we'll narrow it down to the top two three four and um, we'll have publishers come in and do presentations, show us what they have, ask questions. Um, as we've always done in the past, we'll do a showcase where we'll set out the materials from the final three or four that we've selected and have it open throughout the afternoon and the evening. So teachers, so any teachers, parents, community members can come through, look at the materials that are out, see what we're um, considering, and they'll leave feedback via a survey. Um, then the advisory committee will take that feedback they'll take the the information that they've gathered um, they will present to the district improvement committee district education improvement committee um, for consideration that will be our primary district committee that will review um, the considerations and then as an administration every year we come to you with our TEKS, TEKS certification which is our list of materials that we plan to use for the next school year that verifies that we're covering the TEKS in complete, completely and at that time typically in April or May you all um, look over those and that's the time when you approve the selection of all materials for the next school year so that TEAK certification shows what materials we plan on using the next year and that we are planning on covering the TEAKS in its entirety so when we bring that to you it'll have the list of everything we plan on using for the next school year for your approval um, and so that's kind of the process I'll probably come to you guys throughout the semester and just let you know where we are what we're looking at what materials we're honing in on but I just wanted you to have kind of an overview of the process throughout the the next few months any questions on that on the initial committee why is it only teachers in the district oh actually it's not oh. it's teachers administrators and um, instructional support people um, we've never typically had anyone other than teachers on the committee because they're looking at the grade level things like that we do have parents on the DEIC and community members on DEIC so that's why it also goes to a district level committee for input but we will also have the showcase night where parent anyone can come in and look at the materials and give feedback so we do get feedback across the board and that feedback will be taken into consideration by the advisory, advisory committee, committee and DEIC and yes ma'am yes any other questions okay I do want to let you know one other thing um, this came up in the last couple of days um, we have identified an error a data error um, on TEA's end uh, as far as we can tell it's completely something that happened at the state level um, but it refers to our, our star data um, it has to do with the changing of the numbers due to us opening Pleasant View and changing campus numbers things like that um, I just want to let you know I found it um, I'm working on it <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what exactly happened it would be very complex to tell you it just has to do with the number changing and the data is kind of wonky right now but as soon as I figure out what happened I'll let you know what happened and how we can fix it but I just want to let you know we found it it wasn't us it was them and we're gonna get it fixed so thank you thank you dr. Cottle 7F second review and possible consideration of TASB policy update 122 all right yep so policy update 122 um, this is primarily based on the 88th legislature and so uh, numerous legal policies that um, the board does not adopt um, but there are uh, just a handful of local policies that are up for, uh, uh, for up for your discussion and possible approval so uh, with that I will go through uh, the local policies and kind of highlight um, uh, the changes uh, to each of them and answer any questions or try to answer any questions that you might have all right um, so 
uh, CQB local, and um, this information was uh, provided to you, but we uh, gave it to you last month as well, so hopefully you've had a little time to look at these. And so um, CQB local uh, just adds some language um, for a security incident. Uh, this is around technology resources and cybersecurity. So a security incident, uh, that language has been added. And I looked up what a security incident is defined as, and that's a breach or suspected breach and the introduction of ransomware into a computer network or a system. CSA local, uh, this is around facility safety and security. Uh, this is a new policy uh, that has been added. And CSA local is about our door, um, door audits and, and checking our doors uh, weekly. And so that, uh, and then uh, if anything is found, that that's reported to uh, campus administration and to the district uh, safety and security committee. Uh, DC local, uh, this is about nepotism for bus drivers, uh, that uh, nepotism does not, um, does not apply uh, for our bus drivers, and so there's a note that has been added into DC local um, for employment of bus drivers related to, um, and so th uh, that is referred to in DBE legal. EHB local, uh, this is uh, for curriculum design, this is uh, dyslexia related disorders and basically states that we'll comply with the uh, rules and standards for uh, implementing the program to test students for dyslexia and related disorders. There was one policy that was moved, and that was EHBC local, that was moved to EHBCA local, uh, that had to do with um, HB 4545, which for students who, who did not pass their STAR test, it is now changed to what's called HB 1416. And so because of that, that policy was moved uh, to EHBCA local. So that one was just, just a move. FEA local, uh, this one allows uh, two days uh, of excused absences for, for high school students for career exploration. Uh, so two days as a junior and two days as a senior. So um, if they go to uh, start trying to find the, the right career path for them, they can get four days um, out of high school to go uh, explore uh, for those careers. FFAC local. This is, uh, has to do with wellness and health services and medical treatment. So this requires, uh, this is related to Senate Bill 629, uh, that the district was required to have at least one person who is authorized and trained to administer uh, opioid antagonists um, and that the medication present uh, during regular school hours on each campus that serves grades 6 through 12. And we took care of that quite some time back, um, and, uh, and so that is now uh, in the policy. All right, FFB local, uh, an employee who reports, this is around student welfare and crisis intervention, uh, that an employee who reports a potential threat uh, may elect to have um, uh, the, the employee's identity to remain confidential and not be sub subject to disclosure under public information law. Um, and that, um, that there's a clear procedure for students to report concerning behavior by another student. Right, and FL local, this is uh, student records um, that um, HB 1416 that I mentioned for accelerated learning. Uh, so the references uh, in there have been uh, uh, accelerated learning committee has been replaced with, um, with accelerated education plan. So just a language update there. And those are the local policies uh, from up, uh, update 122. Any questions? 
Yes, I've got a couple, yes, and sir. you might need a lifeline here. Okay. House Bill 3991 uh, designated that uh, this is under special programs, uh, instructional initiatives. Seemed very unique and obscure, but that the first Friday in April is going to be <laughs> Texas Fruit and Vegetable Day. Texas Fruit and Vegetable Day. <laughs> and here's the part requires appropriate instruction. So I get we haven't approved it, we haven't put it into place, but have we given any thought to what that might look like? And that is a legal policy, by yes, the way. So that's we are illegal. required. We're, that's correct. We're going to be. We don't, really don't get a vote on this other than we need no, to vote sir. for it. No, sir. Um, we did talk about dressing up that day as fruits and vegetables. I'm going to be the carrot, and Jeff Metter will be the peas. So we'll, we'll come okay. as peas and Can carrots. Can we sing Veggie Tales songs? <laughs> Yes, so, but we will we'll be required to have instruction around that. So, you want to speak to that? I do, actually. Um, I just I looked back. Um, so, we, our American reading um, is the, a big portion of the reading uh, curriculum that we use. And looking ahead to the end of the school year, which is when this would fall, um, kindergarten is doing entomology, which is bugs. First grade is doing plants. Second grade is doing community. So, those all fall beautifully in line with community helpers. Um, third, fourth, and fifth, we have marine life, states, and civil war. We may have to get a little more creative in there. But I was thinking we have Ag Day that we do at the campuses every year. So if we move that around a little bit, we also have community gardens already set up at some of the campuses. So um, we could re revive those. Um, and I was thinking it really might be an awesome project for a uh, senior project for them to kind of put that in place and do a farmer's market or something like that. But I think we've got some, I've already, my brain since lunch when we've been, we started talking about this today, but um, I've got some ideas on how we can really tie that in and make it a natural thing and not just a, a one more one more thing to do. So yeah, we'll make it happen. Okay. Uh, another question again in that same area, House Bill 3908 uh, designates Fentanyl Poisoning Awareness Week. Obviously a little more on the serious side of things. Here's the part though that um, says may include age appropriate instruction. What age do we consider appropriate for that kind of discussion? And have we done, we've already done done uh, some, well we did the uh, public service stuff uh, for the one pill kills and so, but yeah. So yeah, we've uh, we've got, Ms. Evans and I have some curriculum developed. We're gonna get that uh, hopefully approved recommended from the shack and then to the board right now it's six through 12 is those grade levels that we have to instruct about fentanyl so it's only secondary so we won't do anything in elementary we did do um, fentanyl awareness month we sent out some social media posts and we did some things within the district but it wasn't uh, wasn't actual like, curriculum just yet but we're working on that but it's six through 12. Thank question. you. Have you already <laughs> attempted to have that pass through Shack, and why hasn't it passed? We haven't had a quorum just yet, so we've had two meetings, and so we couldn't take any action. But we've got the curriculum; we've had it on a, a an agenda. It's posted, and we've had a few parents reach out—not many, but just a few—just asking some questions about it. And uh, so Miss Evans and I took some time. We've also looked at some uh, one outside group, Recovery Council. And they've also proposed a curriculum and they just do kind of do a one and done day and then they come back throughout the semester as well. So we're just looking at those options. When is the next SHAC committee? Uh, we've, I've got to plan that. We'll have that sometime in the spring. So we'll meet two times in the spring for a total of four for the year. And will we be doing something different than we have in the past to attempt to have a quorum present? Gonna try. J just to confirm that we'll move through a shack committee yes they have to present. make the recommendation what what they want and then we bring that to to you guys for approval any other questions i make a motion to adopt the tasby policy update number 122 as presented and recommended i'll second a motion by craig a second by krista is there any further discussion all those in favor Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carnes. The time is now 7.50 p.m. and the board will now move into closed session. Pursuant to the following sections, 551.072, which is the discussion of or purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property. 551.073, discussion of negotiated contracts for prospective gifts or donations. 
551.074, discussion of officers, employees, and personnel matters.
All right, the time is now 8, 12 p.m. and the board will reconvene back in open session. I motion to uh, adjourn. I'll second. I have a motion by Terry, a second by Krista to adjourn. If there are no objections, the board will stand adjourned at 8, 12 p.m. Awesome. Good job. You gonna take uh, Marissa and Dennis's? Yes, let's put them in there. Yep. Yes, sir. I got some signing to do.